and welcome to The Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and on this week's episode, I'm joined by Chris Mahan, Technical Manager with Wheel and Crop Protection, and Chagas Beef Specialist Alan Dillon to discuss weed control on farm. Chris, it has been a difficult spring on farm relating to grass, particularly getting an opportunity to control weeds. When is the best time to control docks? As you say, it has been a difficult spring for many farmers to get out and get to spray their dock sprayed before first cut silage. However, there still is plenty of opportunity to do this right through the summer and into the autumn. Most important thing when it comes to dock control is the timing of the dock and spraying them when they're eight to 10 inches higher across and using plenty of water. That's the most important. After spraying the docks, how long do you have to wait until cattle can graze again or if it was going to be cut for silage? Yeah, generally you would leave seven days after you spray before you let stock back in. However, if you're going cutting silage, we do recommend you to leave it 21 days, about three weeks. Um, This is to allow time for the chemical to get down and get into the root to give it a good kill before you cut your silage. And what type of products would be best suited for controlling docks, Chris? Look, generally, where docks are the main weed, we'd be recommended Dockstar Pro. That would be the product of choice, especially if you're going cutting silage again afterwards. That's great. And nettles and thistles, I suppose, are also a very common weed on farm. What would be the best control method for these? Look, a spraying perennial weeds like nettles and thistles is really the is really the only way to, to eliminate them from your swart. So generally, in grazing products, we'd be recommending Forefront Tea. It would be an ideal product of choice for controlling nettles, thistles, docks and even buttercups if they were present. And would they need to be sprayed again the following year? Where infestations are high, it's difficult to eliminate them um, in, one, in, in one spray. So you may need to follow up, especially with nettles, with some spot spraying with Grazon Pro, um, maybe the following year. Would it be advised to cut them prior to spraying or at what stage should they be sprayed at? Yeah, look, generally we'd be always recommending to spray them, you know, when they're green and leafy and small. So if thistles and nettles are gone, say, above the height of your knee, um, to get the best control, we'd recommend to top them and then spray the regrowth about three weeks later. You touched on buttercups there. Would the same apply for controlling buttercups or what would be the case in relation to controlling them? Yeah, look, um, there is a lot of buttercups around this year. Um, you know, buttercups tend to germinate after over a cold and wet winter. And especially then if there's any delay in grass growth in the springtime, um, buttercups tend to get established, you know. So we've seen a lot of them around this year. Look, ideally, you'd like to spray buttercups before they flower. So Pastor Trio will give good level of control when they are in flower, but you would get a much better kill out if they're sprayed before flowering. So look, farmers have two options. The first option is to spray now when they're in flower, you get good level of kill. But the second option would be the better one, which would be to top them and then spray the regrowth about three weeks later. And would the same apply in relation to dandelions? Yeah, not so bad with dandelions when they go into flower because they tend not to be to grow very tall. So look, they can be really sprayed at any time of the year. And luckily enough, nearly all the products that we do will control dandelions, whether that's Dockstar Pro, Aster Trio or Four Fun Tree forefront tea they'll all control dandelions too that's great and in relation to chickweed it has also been an issue on some farms maybe particularly in new lays what do you advise for the control of chickweed yeah look at there's really two main types of chickweed we have the common chickweed which grows as a mat along the ground but there's also then this mouse ear chickweed which grows more as a smaller plant with maybe only two or three branches however it can be widespread across the field It can be more difficult to control the mouse ear chickweed because it has these tiny hairs in the leaf, which then prevent the droplets when they land on the plant actually entering into the plant or the cuticle of the plant. So it is more difficult to kill kill them. Chris, every year advisors highlight the most important part of a reseed is the post-emergent spray. Have you witnessed firsthand where it is not done what happens? Yeah, look, we have indeed. You know, if you allow chickweed to get established in a new lay, it can totally smother out the new grass seedlings, which then results in bare patches forming afterwards, which then in turn allows perennial weeds at a later stage to, adger- to germinate and get established, weeds like docks and thistles. So it is important to eliminate chickweed early, 
But then when it comes to dock control, look, the best time to control docks is in a new sward when they're small soon after receding. So you eliminate the plant before the root gets a chance to get established. So we'd be saying to spray docks, ideally eight to 10 weeks after you reseed. But even if it goes four, five, six months afterwards, if you can get those perennial weeds um, sprayed before the root gets established, um, they tend to eliminate them from the, span of the, from the sward for a number of years afterwards. The products that you'd recommend for spraying for these types of perennial weeds, can you advise on which ones that could be used? And I suppose particularly where clover is sown with the new reseed. Yeah, look, at unfortunately, we're very limited when it comes to clover safe products in new lays. Like there's only really one sort of product out there, a few different brands, um, Clover Max or Under Sown DB. That's really the only one that, 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 that's available if you can get it for controlling broadleaf weeds. However, it doesn't control chickweed then. So then a farmer has to make a choice. Does he leave the weeds or does he use a stronger spray like Pastor Trio, kill out the weeds? But unfortunately, that will kill out the clover but then he could look to reintroduce that clover again at a later stage by overseeding. Multi-species swards are becoming more commonly used. What advice have you for controlling weeds in these swards? Yeah, unfortunately, there's very little advice there because there's very little products that can be used in multi-species. Most of the weeds, like the plantains and the chicory, will be killed by the sprays. So really, you're stuck with just spot spraying perennial weeds with products like Grazon Pro. And in relation to ragwort, I suppose it is becoming an issue on some farms as you're driving around the country. You can see it's more popular this year. What's the best control option for ragwort? Yeah, look, where ragwort has gone strong and in flower, like you say, it is probably at this time of the year, there's very little you can really do in terms of spraying. All you can do is pull them from your field or either cut them and take them out of the sward before you make your hay on silage. However, coming into the autumn time now could be an ideal time to control ragwort that's going to emerge next year. Like ragwort is a biannual plant. So what we mean by this is, this year it'll germinate and stay as a little rosette. It overwinters, and then next year it'll go and seed out and flower out. So a well-timed spray this autumn will eliminate all these little plants that are there currently that are going to germinate next year, or that are going to um, establish and grow next year. So a well-timed spray, even if it's September, October time, can work, work very well. Um, you're not worried then about the stock withdrawal um, then at that stage. So you can close up your paddock in September, October, leave the stock off and, and then the ragwort will be totally gone for the next year. Really, there's only two products that will control ragwort. You've got four front T or then the other op uh, option is products containing 2,4-D. That's great, Chris. Thanks very much. Alan, there has been an increase in rush infestation in parts of the country over the past number of years. How does rush infestation occur and what impact can it have on the productivity of grassland? Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, yeah the, the rush infestation has become probably a little bit more of a problem in the last number of years. We've had maybe a, a couple of wetter, wetter than normal summers in the last decade and um, also maybe a bit of a, a drop maybe in management practices on some farms. Um, typically, look, rushes occur in your heavier type soils with a high clay content. Um, run down sward with low levels of soil fertility, lacks grazing and I suppose poor infrastructure can, can suffer much more with rushes as well. Uh, but also, you know, you can see a lot of swards that are probably relatively dry in nature with maybe some bit of clay content. You know, if these swards aren't managed right and if they're left to their own devices, they can uh, suffer from rush, rush infestation also. Um, typically, look, rushes can, can they're, they're very invasive species. So uh, left unmanaged, you know, they could end up covering up about 80 to 90 percent of any of any grassland sward or any grazable area if left to their own, left to their own devices. Um, and some level of intervention or management is going to be needed to to try and um, to, to try and rectify this, whether it is by mechanical means, right, by topping and drainage, or whether it's by rectifying soil fertility or, or spraying or whatever whatever the option is taken by farmers. And what are the main strategies that are used for control that we've outlined some of them there? Yeah, I suppose the, the typical one is, is the topping and then the mowing uh, or the mulching in, in, in later in more recent years. Um, and they're fine, but look, they're they're uh, they're not going to solve the problem. You're still going to have the rushes coming back. They will they will clean the sward off and it will leave it eligible for, for your BPS payment. Um, but uh, they don't, it's not a long-term management strategy. Really, if you want to control rushes, 
long term, you have to go into the more expensive options. Um, I suppose rectifying soil fertility, you know, improving your soil P and K levels, to index three and four, uh, or improving your soil pH to uh, in, 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 um, higher than a level of six. Um, you know, you need to regularly graze these fords as well. Lax grazing, you know, with no paddock system in place for cattle are kind of set stocked. That's prime for allowing these rushes to, to develop, um, especially if any level of poaching is occurring. You're, you're opening up that sward, creating these, these pock marks and areas where water can hold. And, and this is ideal for letting the rush plant proliferate as well. Um, so it's, it's, <clears throat> it's, I suppose, those are the main factors you consider first off. And also then there is the drainage option, which is very expensive. You know, a proper drainage job on land can cost you in the region of maybe two to three thousand euros per acre. Um, it's a long term investment. Some people see it as being worthwhile, um, but really and truly every farmer needs to sit down and see what's the best solution for him, uh, especially with some of these environmental schemes that are that are uh, coming down the tracks. You know, there is payments for some less intensively managed swords, so they will have to see what's the payoff going to be in terms of having a maybe a, a new sward with, with uh, good levels of ryegrass in it and, and good soil fertility and drained versus getting maybe some of these environmental payments that might be coming uh, from a sward that's maybe just maintained to the minimum level through maybe just uh, topping uh, or mowing and, and, and regular grazing. Alan, if rushes are not controlled and they dominate the sward, as you outlined, what are the requirements in order to have animals gain access to them, particularly if they're being claimed on the basic payment scheme with regards eligibility? Yeah, I suppose from the Department of Agriculture point of view, what they're looking for is that there's some level of management being done on the farm. You know, where, where the problems typically arise for your BPS payments is where they see no level of agricultural activity, where there's no level of topping, no level of grazing, no level of spraying or management or any of any description being done in the sward and it's kind of left for a while where the rushes completely encroach the ground um, and you know all you, you can see in the middle is bits of dead grass growing up um, you do have to show some level of activity so even if that only means going in and mowing it out and topping it once a year that will suffice once once you're showing that the ground isn't becoming encroached and the ditches aren't growing around it and, and the rushes haven't completely taken over you just have to show, make some bit of an effort, really, and that's what, that's what you have to show. Uh, but leaving land idle and, and and become completely encroached can cause problems with BPS applications. And you mentioned there spraying. Can you describe the spraying strategy for control and rushes? Yeah, you have two options with the spraying. Um, the first and most common one is the use of MCPA. Now, MCPA with regards to rushes, look, rushes are only moderately susceptible to MCPA. We don't actually have a uh, a product that is available that is actually highly susceptible to, to for rushes. Um, MCPA, I suppose, is something that's caused a bit of controversy in the last couple of years and that it's been found in waterways. And it's it's so easy, I suppose, for an MCPA exceedance to occur. A single drop in, in a typical stream can, can cause an exceedance in the allowance for, for 30 kilometers straight in, in going into drinking water. So um, effectively, there was almost a zero tolerance to MCPA in waterways, just short of it. Um, the problem with MCPA is it's, it doesn't bind to the ground in the same way as, let's say, other products such as glyphosate does. It, it tends to, I suppose, if you were to put in layman terms, it tends to stay on the ground and it can translocate easily. So if you're spraying around the field and going near a boundary, um, which regards, uh, you know, with, with your boom sprayer and you, you swing the boom over the when you're turning and it goes over a dry, a dry drain even, that MCPA can sit in that dry drain until water comes and it can carry it down into a stream that way. So same with sloping fields, same with bits of hollows and fields, etc. The MCPA can sit there for a long period of time and can eventually find its way into, into waterways. The second option and I suppose the more a slightly safer option, I suppose, if you are grow spraying, is to use uh, glyphosate through a weed wiper. MCPA is not actually licensed for use through a weed wiper, so glyphosate is the only option there. Um, and basically, I suppose the biggest thing there is, is that there's less chemical use. It's a it's a concentrated form of the of the of the, the spray, and it's rubbed along the the rush plants through the weed wiper. Um, and I suppose, look, it's it's a cheaper option for both application and for uh, cost to spray as well. Uh, so it's it's probably something that's a bit safer to use uh, versus the MCPA option. But look, MCPA is a very important spray in this country. At the same time, 
it's about farmers having a bit of respect for the product and, and knowing how to manage it and ensuring that they're spraying in ideal conditions where there's dry weather forecast, et cetera, to avoid this MCPA leaking into waterways and, and causing more upset. Thanks, Alan. Finally, Chris, with all the sprays that we've outlined for control of the different type of weeds, what is the recommendation in relation to sprayer use and best practice? Yeah, look, farmers will, um, it's important that farmers keep good records of what they spray, number one. Um, it's important that they only use registered products. So a product will have a PCS number written on the front of it. So it's important to remember that. Um, when it comes to out spraying in the fields, um, as was mentioned earlier there by Alan, buffer zones are important. So all sprays will have a buffer zone that could either be one meter or up to five meters away from the top of a water course. So it's important that farmers uh, do do break best practice and avoid um, and and keep that in mind look farmers do need to be trained in the use of a sprayer so any farmer using a, a boom sprayer or even a knapsack sprayer will have to have done the, the the proper training in order to be registered to use a pesticide otherwise he'll have to get a contractor aid in to do it and then in, in recent years all sprayers do need to be tested and um, so new sprayers are okay uh, and they and they'd be sufficient for i think up to five years but any older sprayer would need to be tested once every five years so it's important to to keep that in mind as well to make sure that it's working well and the pesticides are going on correct that's great chris thanks very much chris and alan thank you that's all for this week's episode and my thanks to chris and alan for joining me on the show you can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the beef edge podcast on the chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.